Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Robin. I'm one of the pastors, and I want to welcome you to worship on this first weekend in February. And in case you didn't know, it's Super Bowl Sunday, for those of you that are interested. If you're a guest, we're glad you're here. And we hope that you're encouraged as we worship our living Lord together. I just want to point out, you've probably noticed that we have simplified our program. We've gone to a half sheet on both sides. And also, the sermon notes are separate. If you would like a copy of the sermon notes, they're on the table in the lobby. As you come in, you can pick one up. And if you did not get one this morning and would like one, there's ushers in the back. You can just raise your hand if you like sermon notes. But in the future, what we can do is pick them up on the table in the lobby. So there's a few people over there who would like some. The Bible says in the last days, people's love will grow cold and violence will increase in our world. And with each passing day, we see more violence, more evil in the world that we live in. So the question is, how do we as followers of Jesus Christ impact the world we live in? Is there anything we can do to make a difference? Well, I'm happy to say yes. There is something we can do. And as we continue our study in the book of Romans, today's passage is a clear call to action. And it gives the solution to the problem of evil. So please turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Now this passage is different from the one we looked at last weekend because there are over 20 short exhortations that come at you in a rapid fire kind of way. So be prepared. They're short and they're powerful. But the great thing is when you combine them all together, they form one main idea, which is both powerful and simple. So if you would, please stand with me as we read Romans chapter 12. I'll begin at verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Now each one of the over 20 exhortations could serve as the text for an entire sermon. And yet together, 
they form one main idea which is both simple and profound, and this is what it is. Genuine love in action is the best way to overcome evil in our world. Paul paints a beautiful picture of the actions of love. And we see a vivid description of what genuine love looks like in our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. He gives us our marching orders, how to love people well. And that includes those people we think are unlovable. You know, at the end of our lives, I'm confident that all of us here would like to be remembered as someone who loved others well. And this chapter shows us how to do just that. And it begins by calling us to be eager to love one another. You know, a lot of ways this passage is like a checkup. You go to the doctor. What do they do? They check your vital signs, your blood pressure, your pulse, your temperature, to see if you're physically healthy. This is a spiritual checkup where Paul gives us vital signs of a healthy Christian. And he begins with the most important vital sign. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast or cling to what is good. Do you remember what Jesus said was needed that we need to do so that others would know that we're Christians? What was it? We are to love one another. Jesus told the disciples, others will know you're my follower if you have love for one another. And our love needs to be genuine, which means it's without hypocrisy. Now, the word hypocrisy was used with an actor in the Greek world to portray an emotion. Happiness, there'd be a mask. If they were sad, there'd be a mask. And so the expressions of emotion could change with the removal of a mask. And Paul says, as Christians... We are not to wear masks. Instead, we're to love one another with a genuine and sincere love. And to help us do that, he gives two commands. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. You know, this is the only place in the New Testament where the word translated abhor is used. And it means to have a vehement dislike for something. You know, genuine love does not tolerate evil, but instead it holds fast or it clings to what is good. That's why it's the best way to overcome the evil in our world. The next verse includes what our attitude should be toward other believers. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. The word translated brotherly affection was commonly used in wills to communicate affection toward other family members. And Paul's point is that we as believers are to have the same concern for other believers as we do our own family members. The image of being a united, loving family is what we as believers are to portray to the world so that they might see the genuine love we have for one another. Paul says we're to outdo one another in showing honor. We're to look for ways to honor people before they honor us. And we do that by thinking, what can I give to this relationship rather than what can I get out of this relationship? It's surprising 
how quickly you start liking someone when you begin to give them honor and respect. Next, Paul describes what our attitude toward God should be like. He says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Did you hear about the guy who was asked if he thought our ignorance and apathy the two biggest problems in human nature? Our ignorance and apathy the two biggest problems in human nature? And he responded by saying, I don't know and I don't care. Those are the very attitudes that Paul is saying we are to avoid as followers of Christ. We are to show genuine care for others. And we are to seek to help those who are in need. Our world is full of people who are going through trials. And I know some of you are experiencing hard times right now. You know, someone has said that life is full of trials. We're either going into a trial, we're in the middle of a trial, or we're coming out of a trial. And Paul tells us in this passage how we are to respond when we encounter difficult circumstances. We're to rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. You know, the word tribulation, it means pressure or oppression. And it can come from many different sources. It can come from without, with people that don't like us. It can come from cancer within. A difficult circumstance. And Paul says we are to face it with rejoice and hope. The book of James says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You know, when you think about your own spiritual life, when were the times when you noticed a spike in growth? You know, you're going along, something happens, and there's a spike in growth in your spiritual journey. My guess is it probably happened, that spike, when you were going through a trial. I know that's how I came to Christ, was through a trial. But why is it that we grow during the trials? Because when we're dependent upon God, we seek Him, we read His Word, we pray more. Those are the very elements that help us deepen our relationship with Him. So James says, rejoice when you go through the trials. They are a source of growth. Paul said also during this time, be constant in prayer. And I like to say something about the importance of prayer. You may not know that one of the great characteristics and benefits of prayer is that it knits the hearts together of people who pray together. When people pray together, what happens? Their hearts are knit together. That's why if you're married, it is extremely important that you pray with your spouse. Now I know it's challenging and I know we can come up with many different excuses why we don't do it. And the devil does not want us to do it. But when you pray with your spouse, your heart is knit together with them. And it is a statistically proven fact. Couples that pray together stay together. 
We're also to contribute to the needs of the saints, and we're to seek to show hospitality. Now, you may have heard this definition of hospitality. Hospitality is making people feel at home when you wish they were. I think that's true for most Americans. We don't pursue hospitality because we view our home as exclu exclusively reserved for us. You know, I learned a very valuable lesson about hospitality when in the early 80s, for three years, I lived in Nairobi, Kenya. I was there as a missionary teaching Bible to Kenyan high school students. We got a picture of some of my roommates. What would happen in the Kenyan educational system after high school at the end of their last year, they would take a battery of examinations. And if you got a certain score, you were able to go on to university. There was much competition. It was a very stressful time. Now, during that year, after they took their examinations, and they were waiting to see if they got accepted to university, we would invite Kenyans to come live with us for life-to-life -life exposure and for discipling. And here's a picture of some of them. In case you don't know who I am, I'm on the end. But here's what I learned about hospitality. In Africa, it is held in high regard. It's a Middle Eastern cultural thing. Hospitality is extremely important. And as an American, it was challenging for me because this is what would happen. When I was cooking the meal for the four or five roommates and almost done, ready to serve the food, put it on the table, here's what happened. Be a knock on the door. And there'd be four or five other Kenyans who just showed up. And it's an honor if someone comes to visit you, it's an honor that they would do so. So certainly you would invite them to come in and share your food. It took me a long time not to get frustrated. As an American, we'd say, don't you know what time it is? It's dinner time. What are you doing coming here at dinner time? Totally the opposite spectrum in their mentality. Hospitality is a wonderful way to show how we can accept and love one another. And whether you're living in Africa or the United States, there's something special about being invited into someone's home. Now, your house doesn't have to be spotless, and it's okay if you're not Martha Stewart or Betty Crocker. You know, and during this month, where we celebrate Valentine's Day. What a wonderful way to express love to other people. What a practical way to care for them than by demonstrating hospitality. Another way to demonstrate genuine love is to repay cursing with blessing. Now, Paul repeats Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, bless those who persecute you, Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, there's an old proverb that says, shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half a sorrow. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we've been given the privilege of coming alongside people when they experience pain and loss and sorrow, and we get to be with them, and we get to see the grace of God at work in their lives. Paul concludes this section with, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Now, Paul's not saying we need to agree on every issue. But he is saying we need to be unified because of our common salvation in Christ. And we should remember and be humbled by the fact that we're sinners. And we are desperately in need of God's mercy 
and grace and forgiveness. And that should humble us so that we don't think more highly than what we should. So in the first section of this passage, Paul calls us to display genuine love toward other people. In the next section, he calls us to overcome evil with good. Now, this section of Scripture has been described as the most challenging teaching in the entire Bible. It's not only challenging, it's flat-out impossible. All of God's commands are beyond our ability to accomplish in the flesh. But these especially reveal our need to rely upon Him. You know, Paul begins with a bang when he says, Repay no one evil for evil. And our natural response is when we're wrong, we want to hit back. We want to strike back and get revenge. I'm a big fan of the actor Charles Bronson. How many of you guys remember Charles Bronson? Yeah. You know, he was in over 90 movies. And they all have basically the same theme. It started with him being wronged, treated poorly by someone. And then the rest of the storyline of the movie was he got revenge. He paid back to the person or persons that harmed him. And you know, in my flesh, that really appeals to me. It's just, yeah, that person treated him wrongly. He's getting back and he's getting them. Yet Paul says, that's how the world operates. That's not what you should do as a follower of Christ. And if you do that, you are allowing the world to squeeze you into its mold. Paul takes it even farther when he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And the phrase is, if possible... And as far as it depends on you, they show that we can't force others to do what's right. It also raises the question, what happens when you are trying to live peaceably and you get beat up even more? What do you do then? Living at peace doesn't mean you continue to put yourself in a situation where you may be harmed. Once you've done everything within your power to resolve a conflict, you have fulfilled your responsibility to God. And the best thing we can do is to continually ask God for wisdom how to live peaceably with others. Paul makes it clear in the midst of all this Never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know, this verse comes to mind when I'm watching the news and I hear about all the women that have been abused. I hear about the shootings in the schools. I hear about that family that for years in prison, there are 13 children. And I think those are the people we should get back. And yet we're commanded to never pay back evil for evil to anyone, regardless of what they've done. That flies smack in the face of people who say, don't get mad, just get even. I know you've heard that. It's what the world says we're to do. That's the way the world operates. And if that's the way we behave, the world has squeezed us into its mold. That is not what Paul says. He slams the door shut on taking revenge. And instead, he says, leave room for the wrath of God. Now, if someone breaks the law, We're to report them to the authorities. In the next chapter, Paul describes how he uses, God uses, the civil government for judgment. 
God is the final judge. And he is just in punishing those who have sinned against you. Remember, he said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Paul wraps up this chapter with some unique commands. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Paul's quoting from the book of Proverbs. And the verse in Proverbs says, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. You'll heap burning coals on his head. And the principle here is the best defense is a good offense. I'm sure both teams playing today in the Super Bowl, they already know that. The best defense is to have a good offense. So, when someone reviles you, the best defense you can have is to go on the offense and show them kindness and love. There's even a possibility you may win them over by being kind to them. Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. Paul concludes, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And to return evil for evil, it comes naturally to us. That's why we're good at it. You know, one area I'd like to mention where we have the opportunity to overcome evil with good is in social media. A couple of weeks ago, our Next Gen Ministry with Ward Crawley, Pastor Keith, they presented a family faith talk on internet safety. They presented helpful information, how we can use social media for good. In case you missed it, it was recorded. You can contact the office. They can let you know how to see it. But in all areas of our life, in any area of communication, we are to overcome evil with good and not lash back and avenge. You know, earlier I said I'm confident that all of us here would like to be remembered as someone who loved others well. It's a wonderful legacy to leave behind. And each Thursday morning I meet with my men's life group. And a while ago I asked them to write out what they would like people to say about them at their funeral. And each morning we'd have different men share what they had written. We called it living with the end in mind. And the idea was, if that's the way, or if that's what you want people to say about you at your funeral, then... How are you living now? So that's what they will say then. And one of the members of our group was a man named Brenton Barnett. Passed away last May. And I have a copy of what Brenton wrote. Brenton Barnett, live your life with the end in mind. And I was able to read some of these things at his funeral. And I'd just like to read this, what Brenton wrote. I want to be remembered as a loving husband. I want to be remembered as a loving father. I want to be remembered as a loving grandfather. I want to be remembered as a man who trusted in Jesus and was faithful to the end. Brenton knew how he wanted to be remembered. And with God's help, he lived that way. 
That's a wonderful example for all of us to follow. I'd like to conclude by giving you a couple of next steps you can take. And the first is, identify those relationships where you need to grow in love. Now, this could be a family member. It could be a co-worker. It could be a neighbor. could be someone here at church. Identify someone that you want to grow in love. And with God's help, seek to love them well by your actions. The second step, if you haven't done so already, please take the gifts assessment. If you're not familiar with that assessment, it's a tool where you can learn about your spiritual gifts, your personality, how God has designed you to serve others. Over 120 people have taken the assessment. I want to thank you for those that have taken it. If you have not, the information's on your program or on the screen on how you can take this gift's assessment. Well, we've come to the end of one of the richest chapters in one of the richest books of the entire Bible. You know, it doesn't get much better than Romans chapter 12. And as we apply the truths from this chapter to our life, and that's what we're to do, not just be hearers, but doers. As we apply the truths of this chapter to our life, it will help us love others well, and it will help us to overcome evil. And the world we live in desperately needs people who will do both. Love well, overcome evil with good. Let's pray together. If you're here this morning and and not yet a Christian, we want you to know if you open your heart to God, you will find genuine, unconditional, forgiving love. You also can be a part of a family of believers here at Stonebridge that seek to love others as Jesus loved. And if you are a Christian, God is calling you to love others radically and sacrificially just as Jesus did. God is calling you to demonstrate genuine love in action because it is the best way to overcome evil in our world. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for giving us the example of how to love well. We are only able to love others because you first loved us. And we thank you for loving us, for dying for us. And we confess that we need your help in loving others well. Our prayer is when others see us and when they see Stonebridge Church, they will say they must be Christians because of their love for one another. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.